Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Military Monday show, where every first Monday, of course, is Military Monday, we chat with military history author and uh, Mike Wardia, but he's not just an author. He's a historian. He's an educator. And uh, also, he, you can see him on the History Channel. So, you know, he's pretty cool. So he's here every first Monday. Go to his website, MikeGuardia.com. Today, we're going to be talking about the invasion of the Philippines, and it ties into his latest book, which is called Coyote Recon, The Forgotten Wars of Colonel J.D. Vanderpool. You can get it now. His other book that's also out, his latest one, is Combat, The Combat's Diaries, True Stories from the Front Lines of World War II. But uh, Mike, am I right, Military Mike? It's 25 books. Did you say that on the show the other day? That's right. Oh, wow. Dude. Now. How do you, See, how I, how I do, you do have that? 23 in 2023, but apparently you're a little ahead. <laughs> that, oh. That's a lot of writing. Mm-hmm. I like to say half jokingly that it's the only thing I'm good at. So I got to take what I'm good at and I got to run with it. So. Well, you are good at it. You're a good writer because I think what you have, and we've talked about this on the show, I know, is you're, you bring in the human story of what happens in battle, what happens even, you know, between a soldier and their tank or their F-15 or F-14. You put the people into the picture of history, which you've got to be an amazing teacher because you teach as well, right? So yeah. your, your students must be really gaining that knowledge because it, history is hard to learn unless you have yeah. a human element. How did you start learning history? Like, was it being in the service that led you into this field or were you always interested? No, I think it was really something that I always kind of gravitated towards, you know, I mean, it was really something that I always had an interest in. I mean, I was always fascinated by all of these stories of all of these people who had come before and all of the hardships and all of the trials that they had to go through. And it just really made me, well, I think in a sense, it not only made me very interested to learn about what they were thinking and what they were feeling as they, they were going through all those things, but, you know, also it just made me want to learn even more about all of the circumstances and all of the situations that were surrounding that particular point in time where those people found themselves. And it was really just uh, something that really, that uh, re re really sparked a passion. And, uh, you know, it really just made me want to learn even more. And, uh, you know, all of the, uh, all of the different all of the different great stories and all and all all of the mysteries about history that uh, you know that had been you know that had been put forward on all of these uh, all of these um, documentaries and and all these books. I just wanted to learn more of it, and that's really what put me down the road to becoming a historian. Just wanting to capture that human element and be able to uh, take the stories that I had heard and find something else in history to where I could tell it in a similar form and fashion and uh, maybe inspire somebody else at some point down the line. It's an interesting thing with what you've done in the last few books, like the Combat Diaries, you've, you've, you've been able to talk to survivors of war before they pass on just in you know natural circumstances. Mm -hmm. But you know J.D. Vanderpool, uh, who we're gonna talk about today with his work in, in the, Philipp the invasion of the Philippines, which was a bloody war. I mean, what I, that was some serious craziness. Mm -hmm. You have this ability to to now kind of capture those last stories, you know, and then you tell stories going and getting the research, researching, talking to families like you did for Hal Moore. Um, mm -hmm. And you got to meet Hal Moore, you know, which was something, you know, and connect with him on his books and in the books you wrote together. But do you feel like a like you, you've got to haul, like move it to get things done before, you know what I mean? Do you feel like a, that ticking clock? And yet at the same time, you can't go too fast. Otherwise, you know, you can't, you know, haste makes waste. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right. So really what it all boils down to is it's a very delicate balance between really trying to hustle as much as you can and also trying to take your time to really try to get a coherence to uh, try to get a cohesive narrative uh, uh, down on paper, excuse me. 
so that really is the fine balancing act that you have whenever you're writing these stories. And, uh, you know, it's always a, um, it's always accompanied by a sense of urgency because you really want to get the story out there and you really are very anxious to tell people about it but at the same time you have to worry about things like quality control and then a lot of your mm -hmm. timeline is also tethered to the timeline of whatever production staff that you're working with because they have to put the book in a typeset and you know they have to do a lot of the marketing on their end and then you have to do the marketing on your end so uh, there are a lot of moving pieces associated with this timeline wherever you find yourself in it. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, that sense of urgency, it is always there and it's always spurning you on. And uh, I think in a sense, the urgency kind of inspires a little more creativity and probably a little more innovation than would otherwise be there because they say that like necessity is the mother of invention. So, you know, you, I guess, force yourself and maybe even on a subconscious level, you tend to tell the narrative better if you feel like you're really compelled to get the story out and really share this with the masses. Hmm. Rich, do you think you would ever write something like a screenplay? Because sometimes when I read through hmm. your books, I feel like oh, these I know, like everything could be a play. Movie. All of it should yeah, be a movie, like, a play. I think that that would be something that would be you know i don't know how hard it would be because i've never done it but i think it, it feel like you could do it thank you well um writing a screenplay is actually something that i have thought a lot about um i actually started researching what the dynamics are for a screenplay i started researching that about a year ago oh. and it is something that is on my bucket list it's just oh, really cool. a matter of time of you know it, of really finding the time to do it and seeing if I can adapt everything that I've already put on paper to a cohesive screenplay and one that would really catch the attention of any Hollywood producers out there. Well, I think uh, right now cool. Hollywood is, from some mm -hmm. of the interviews we've done recently with authors, Hollywood, um, like Netflix, Hulu, all these places, you know, basically we're, we're really eating a lot of content as you know people were binging especially when there's storms mm -hmm. winter storms outside i won't whine anymore about it because then we're going to talk about jd vanderpool and everybody that went through the invasion of the philippines and i can't complain because i was that if you want to complain you had to be in that war that was just it, terrible <laughs> but um you know we tend to watch a lot i mean people binge watch and it's like mm -hmm. it used to be that you'd have to wait an, an episode every week or something and everybody you know back in the day would run home from school do you remember running home from school mike well, i mean of course we had to catch those abc after school specials yeah, yeah i mean it was like that was the thing and then if yeah. not i mean reruns i mean that only happened what in summer in this country where i lived like uh, good luck on that one but you know it's so it now it's like seriously people want new stuff and so netflix and who and all these places and apple and i'm just saying everybody out there in that tv land um you've got content sitting there with mike's books as they are now too even though and then he could write this you know the screenplay or the stage play for that but i think i think so many people's stories are and jd vanderpool your latest book coyote recon and i know we've done an interview uh you know about him but and it's your latest book but I mean, his story is incredible. He was just such a like he he was dealt. He was one of those people. Here's your you know you're dealt this really crappy hand of cards of everything and you know right. survival of the fittest. And he just used that to really propel himself through the, his military career. But um, right so you want to kind of before we get into him, give everyone a little background on this invasion of the Philippines when it happened because. I mean, that gets into Bataan and it gets into all these different, I mean, it was, it's back to the Japanese doing things again, right? right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think really to understand it, you have to wind the clocks back to about 1937. And uh, this is when you see a lot of the Japanese aggression in the Pacific really start to reach critical mass because at this point they have already invaded Manchuria. 
they have already had a longstanding presence inside the Korean Peninsula, and they are dead set on expanding throughout the Pacific as much as they can. And uh, us, for our part, you know, we are we are seeing all of this happen from our perch, not only in the Philippines, but also from Hawaii and also in the mainland US. And we're thinking to ourselves, okay, well, we see the brutality that mm -hmm. the empire of Japan is capable of. So uh, is it only a matter of time before this type of brutality starts to come to our home shores? And they said, okay, well, in a protracted naval war across the Pacific, Japan's probably not going to fare too well against us. But if they are going to get a toehold anywhere, they have pretty much two opportunities to shoot their wad. They're going to have to invade the Philippines, and they're going to have to take it over very quickly. And around the same time, they're also going to have to launch an attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, there are a few constraints that are really working against them. For one, it's a very long way to steam a Navy to get to Pearl Harbor. And, you know, we think we have enough early warning systems that we would be able to detect any kind of an attack force coming. So those are really the two places of vulnerability that we have. But we think the Philippines is going to be an easier target. So if they do strike anywhere, it's probably going to be there first. But separate and apart from anything that the Japanese are doing, the bigger problem, the bigger threat we actually think is going to be in Europe, because we think if the war does come to our shores, it's going to come from Germany long before it ever comes from Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, since we have seen everything that the Luftwaffe and the Kriegsmarine have been doing all throughout mainland Europe, they're really the big problem. Um, so oh. the cards fell as they did, and we pretty much knew that war was going to come at some point. We just didn't know where that first strike was going to be. And uh, lo and behold, um, we actually had a two for one special because they attacked Pearl Harbor the same day that they, they in, in invaded the Philippines. You know, the, the, the date was only different wow. between the international date line. Um, but th those two attacks were carried out pretty much oh. simultaneously. And the Philippines were probably in the worst shape of combat readiness that they could ever hope to be in at that particular mm. point because all of, the, all, all of the defense dollars that we had had been reallocated away from that particular area. And, you know, the, the, the defense force that we had at the time to mount a coherent defense of the Philippines really wasn't going to amount to much more than a speed bump. So it didn't come as a surprise to anyone where, you know, within barely four months after the Japanese made landfall in the Philippines, that you know, the last American forces would surrender at Bataan. And uh, it really devolved into a comedy of errors because you, know, you had the Japanese make landfall on the 8th of December and the American Philippine lines collapsed pretty quickly. They stabilized mm -hmm. for a little bit right around Corregidor and right around the Bataan Peninsula. But by, I, I wanna say by the 1st of April, the writing was very clearly on the wall that we were not we were not going to come out the winners on this. And that, that's when you had MacArthur jump into the speedboat and say, I shall return. And he, mm -hmm. he gave the order to surrender. Now, here's where things get a little bit tricky in terms of what the American forces are supposed to do on the ground at this point, because technically they've been given an order to surrender. But, you know, even the average rank and file soldier isn't going to rely too heavily on the improbable good graces of the Japanese, because really, mm. for yeah. lack of a better term, they know better. I mean, you know, they've seen mm. the newsreels and they've seen all of the atrocities that mm. the Empire of Japan is capable of carrying out. So that puts a lot of them in a conundrum to say, OK, well, do I obey the order to surrender and take my chances in a Japanese prison camp, which likely I'm not going to survive. Are they going to execute me for their own amusement? Or do I take a chance on disobeying the order and carrying on the fight against the Japanese by other means and you know, try to beg for forgiveness instead of asking for permission? Because mm -hmm. if I can carry on the fight against the Japanese, well, it becomes a matter of six of one, half a dozen of the other. Okay, am I gonna take my chances um, dying in combat? trying to fight the Japanese as a guerrilla? Am, uh, am I going to take my chances being captured as a POW and, and likely not live to tell about it? 
or do I spend the rest of my dying days in the military brig because technically I disobeyed the order to surrender? Well, if I'm given those three options, you know what? I'd likely die in combat as a guerrilla and maybe take the mm -hmm. chance of saying, well, yeah, I disobeyed the order to surrender, but look, I killed so many Japanese and I made it that much easier for you guys to come back later. So mm -hmm. you had quite a few guys take that first option there. And uh, what, what ended up happening was that uh, the Americans in the Philippines who were caught behind the lines, they, they, they ended up making these hybrid guerrilla units, um, one of which was occupying the southern part of Luzon. And this was a, a very interesting guerrilla outfit. They were called the R ROTC guerrillas. And mm. it, was, it was an informal nickname given to this guerrilla group because many of the members of this guerrilla unit had once, they had once been cadets of the Philippine Military Academy. So, you know, they, they were all like the freshman and sophomore cadets who, you know, after the Japanese invasion, the uh, commandant of the academy said, hey, we're going to shut the academy down, you know, just go home. And, and a lot of them said, well, hey, you know what, instead of just going home and instead of, you know, just trying to wait this conflict out, well, hey, I came to this military academy to be an officer. Well, shoot, I'm just going to make myself an officer two years earlier than I had anticipated. And, you know, uh -huh. I'm going to start this guerrilla movement out there. So the ROTC guerrillas, they were doing quite a bang up job down in Southern Luzon. And uh, that was the guerrilla unit that, uh, that Jay Vanderpool, that's the one he ended up making contact with. And he and, became and a was he, Cause didn't he go to Hawaii too? So did he go from, am I getting my, he went from Hawaii yeah. to there, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he sure did. Okay. So he, he was at Pearl Harbor when it happened. Uh, he, he was one of the survivors there. And, you know, he was also among the unfortunate few who was picking up the pieces at uh, mm. Pearl Harbor, you know, after the, uh, after the Japanese attack. And, you know, he says to himself, okay, well, we think now that the Japanese are not going to do a land invasion of Hawaii. So I'm going to go with my unit, the 25th Infantry Division, and we are going to deploy to these inaugural battles here in the Pacific. And he fights on Guadalcanal, he fights in New Georgia, and uh, it was... Um, it was about uh, two years into that campaign that uh, you know he, he was working up at uh, he was working up at the general headquarters, and that that's when they got the communique that says, "Hey, we need somebody for a uh, we need somebody for a highly hazardous, um, um, highly dangerous mission to be an allied liaison to these guerrilla units." And he said, "Well, hey, you know this really sounds right up my alley. I mean, it's all it's all patrolling and tracking and." All, all that good stuff that I learned when I was growing up in the American wilderness. So, yeah. Hey, wow. how, I'm your guy. How, if we look at Japan, it's such a tiny country. It yeah. just seems kind of weird to me that, I mean, how did they actually get together so many people to fight on their behalf? Because, I mean, it they can't have... You know, here we are, the United States and half of Europe, and here comes this tiny island of people. Mm -hmm. How did they actually manage to do what they did? Like, did how many people did they actually have to go into well, combat? Well, they you know had quite a lot, and you know, it uh, it really was a testament to how Japan not only saw itself, but also its position in the affairs of the Pacific and also in Asian affairs as well. So, I mean, re really to answer that question, um, you kind of have to take a look at a lot of the ethnocentric Japanese thought and also how they saw themselves as a function of where they were in the world. Because, you know, you had for, I'd say, most of the past, let's see, so if we start with 1942 and we wind the clocks mm -hmm. back to the 1500s, so like for the past 400 years, Japan itself had really been going through uh, a, it really had been going through a constant state of revolution because, you know, they were getting over the feudal period and, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and, and now they're finally opening up trade to the West. And, you know, the, uh, the I can say the lineage of thought that had been passed down through the generations was, you know, hey, we are a unique people. We are here and we have been or, or ordained by the divine spirits to command this uh, special place in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now here we are, we're going into the industrial revolution. We're finally 
opening up trade with the West. And, you know, we also see ourselves jumping light years ahead of where everyone else on mainland Asia is at this point. And, you know, when you combine that with a lot of how Japanese society thought at the time, you know, you have the holdover from the from from the Bushido warrior code, you know, and how that how that pretty much permeates everyday life. You know, that's where you get uh, that really is where you get the recipe for how the Japanese government acted the way they did and how they were how they were able to mobilize a very wide swath of the population. And I think really what helped them, if we were to look at maybe the, uh, the past 25 years, right before the Second World War started, there was also a, there was a pretty heavy propaganda campaign that was initiated by the Japanese government in the sense that, you know, they not only saw themselves as a unique race of people, within Asia, but they also they, they also started telling their own people, hey, it is pretty much us against the world. And I think it was right around the mid 1930s wow. where they started saying, hey, uh, we are really victims of what we call the ABCD encirclement because we are being encircled and we are being harassed by the Americans, the British, the Chinese and the Dutch. Hmm. So. Yes, yeah, so, 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 so we here as the Japanese people were suffering from this ABCD encirclement. And not only that, we have to push back and we have to establish our place here that has been inspired by these divine spirits to give us this particular, wow. uh, to give us this particular place here in the hmm. Pacific. So, you know, when you have all that going on and when you mix it in with the heavy propaganda machine, because the Japanese, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of the imperial government, they were really masters of propaganda. We mm -hmm. say that, you know, we say, you know, here in the States, oh, we had these, uh, you know, we, we, we had these racist uh, posters that, you know, were characterizing the Japanese according to X, Y, and Z. But what a lot of historians tend to forget is that the Japanese were just as guilty of that as well, because, oh, yeah. you, because you had posters all over Tokyo that, you know, had FDR with, you know, had, had devil horns. And mm -hmm. you, you Tokyo know. Rose is part of that, isn't isn't she part of that? Right. Well, right, exactly. and, mm -hmm. and there's a bunch of Tokyo Roses. It wasn't just one, you know, radio lady. It was like a gazillion of them out there. And then the doll mm -hmm. woman spy. So didn't the women come in on the propaganda yeah, from all yeah, over? They sure did. They sure did. Wow. So, yeah, so it, it uh, it's a, mm. it, it, it's a very long and complicated um narrative you know that goes along with how they were acting the way they did and why they acted the way they did but you know i mean it was pretty much your perfect storm of all of those different mm -hmm. emotions and all of those different propaganda techniques that met at that intersection of space and time and mm -hmm. you just said okay well hey th wow. th this is what we're dealing with and this is what we have to go with wow and wow. so they go after the philippines mm -hmm. but they also didn't they kind of get a little smug in this whole kind of war where at some point they thought you know they've got it covered and we kind of mm. riled up a little bit and then it became like a longer war than everybody thought well i i think there were a lot of miscalculations that were made on both sides uh for yeah. one for one we didn't really consider japan to be all that much of a threat and yeah most folks who had any type of decision-making authority knew that there was going to be a war, but they knew pretty much from the outset that it was going to be very hard, hard for Japan to win it. And also the Japanese knew that too, which I think is what influenced the, the, uh, the calculus of their own decision-making because, you know, they said, all right, well, if we are going to have any chance of winning, then we are really going to have to take out the Pacific fleet in one stroke. And they were hoping they were hoping to do that with the attack on Pearl Harbor. And the irony is, is that they would have succeeded had the aircraft carriers not been away on maneuver. Um, mm. So mm. that is one thing that, uh, that, that 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 was one tremendous miscalculation on their part. Mm. So I think both sides were equally guilty of really. Mm really forecasting how the conflict would play out and uh and uh you know i also think that uh i also think that both sides were a little too optimistic going into it but one thing that i can say uh that um was a 
prudent decision that was made on the Allied war effort was the decision to end the war when they did. And I know that this is probably going to rile uh, a few viewers out there, but I also think that uh, I also think that the introduction of the A bomb was one of the things that precipitated this conflict, and it mm -hmm. was and it was a tool that, in the long term, saved a lot more lives than it took. Because mm -hmm. you know, detractors of the bomb, they you know, they uh, I, I think they've conveniently forgotten that uh, the mm -hmm. that we were anticipating an, an invasion of the Japanese mainland, and for their part, so were the Japanese, because they you know they. they were digging trenches all along all along the beaches of Honshu, and you had civilians who were being issued pitchforks to attack paratroopers. You know, there was no question in anybody's mind that this was going to be a very long gutter war and probably would have gone on for um, a most conservative estimate, probably another three years before it finally reached a stopping point. And there was one point in the book where, uh, where Vanderpool himself was even saying, you know, uh, the anticipated casualty rate for what we were expecting and what we were anticipating, we were probably going to go through a new regimental commander about every two weeks. And wow. I'm thinking regimental wow. commanders, you're talking about a guy who was at least a full bird colonel. So if the combat is that intense that a full bird colonel is wow. gonna get killed every two weeks, yeah, that's, it's probably gonna be really bad. I mean, it's- really And you're gonna run out of people at some that's point. That's chaos. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was yeah. like hundreds of thousands of people died. I mean, this was, this was, like I say, a bloody battle. And so, yeah. so the atom bomb, so this brings up the atom bomb, like, here we come. And mm -hmm. so our country starts this, I know it's part of our National Park Service, is yeah. are these sites, Los, Los Alamos and New Mexico, and New Mexico is interesting with that. And then we've got one in, I think, Washington State, and I'm forgetting mm -hmm. another one. Ah, there's another one, Tennessee, right where we are recording from. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one down the road. And it's so fascinating because we took that whole role of everybody shut up, don't say anything. I mean, they have photos of like, you know, you don't see anything, billboards within these parks. Like, well, there weren't parks at that time yeah. where you need to shut up and you can't tell your family what you're working on. That's some, mm -hmm. and and then there were people who didn't know what they were working on, right? For mm -hmm. this, wow, we mm -hmm. need to do a whole show on that. That's <laughs> that's like some that's some of our crazy history of America. But you go like at this point, we needed to pull something out, like right. We needed to pull that that mm -hmm. card because mm -hmm. we needed some something. And if I we just, hadn't, I, I yeah. just feel like we so underestimated yeah. on a national level. I, and I, I keep going back to just the the size of Japan and um, this feeling that they weren't ready and we were. It, I just think we miscalculated big time the the real threat that they turned out to be somehow, yeah. you know. Um, it just you know when you read about it, then you think, well, how come, you know? What happened that made us so underestimate what they were able well, to Pearl do? Harbor, what Pearl what, what did we not know? Too. What did yeah? But what did we not know about them that that um, you know, What part were we missing in this whole scene? Well, there were a lot of things that we were missing, and I think the broadest stroke that I could paint would be that we underestimated each other pretty badly. Um, but I think Yamamoto said it best when he said after the attack on Pearl Harbor was done, he said, you know, I fear all that we've done is awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. Mm -hmm. uh, so as far as Pearl Harbor itself is concerned, you know, there were a lot of warning signs that were missed and there were a lot of unhappy coincidences. And, you know, from that body of knowledge that we do have, uh, there have come every conspiracy theory under the sun about what yeah. we knew, when we knew it, and what we could have done to prevent it. But, you know, the, uh, the thing is, is that um, we didn't anticipate the attack coming as early as it was. And I, you know, there were also delays in how fast we could decode all of the messages that, that uh, all the messages mm -hmm. that, that the Japanese were sending to each other. 
So I think it was really just your 360 degree breakdown in communication and, mm. uh, you know, people making wow. assumptions that they thought were valid, but, you know, just turned out to be dead wrong. Um, mm. you know, but we also wow. in a new era of war. I mean, if you're talking about the atom bomb too and everything, we were kind of in a new way mm. of things happening too. Like just, you know, isn't that kind of Peter, something? Yeah, it, it's different. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's easy to assign blame and it's even mm -hmm. easier for these conspiracy theorists, you know, to come up with all <laughs> of these different notions and theories about like the world you know, is flat. Right, Look, right, the world right. is flat behind you. Look at it. <laughs> uh, well, well, it is in the world of Tron anyway. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but the, it is. And well, I think the conspiracy theories are always when it's it's just a mystery. So. Right. What are you going to do? Conspire and come up with crazy things. But um, I mean, that does lead us to trouble, doesn't it? Conspiracy oh, sure. theories at times. It does. It does. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if there is a happy ending to the story, it is that we we won the war in the Pacific. Right. And, you know, uh, we were able to establish a a uh, a a a very long lasting peace with, mm -hmm. with uh, not only the Japanese government, but also the Japanese people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that, uh, I think that Jay Vanderpool was spot on when he said, you know, hey, uh, you know, I, uh, I agree with, I agree with the leadership that the one thing that we are not allowed to do is we are not allowed to criticize the emperor, because mm -hmm. he is the one person in the empire of Japan who is absolutely positively above reproach mm. and you know, if we mm. if we were to criticize him in any form or fashion i mean that is going to undercut our our not only our war effort but it's also going to under, undercut our efforts to build the peace mm. because mm. we can criticize the government all we want to we can we can tear hideki tojo down all we want but we are not uh, we we are not allowed to uh to verbally or physically lay any type of assault on Emperor Hirohito, because if we mm. do that, and that's uh, you know we 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 have every right to be mad at the Japanese for what they've done, but we also have to remember who our audience is, because we're Americans and we fight wars a particular way. We want to mm. build a lasting peace. So in order for us to try and mend those fences after our inevitable victory, well. The only way that we're going to do that is to, uh, you know, just make sure that uh, we're going to be, we, 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 we have to make it clear, okay, one, we are not here to depose the emperor. We are just here to help you back on your feet and build a, lost, build a long lasting peace between us because, you know, you've seen what we've done to your troops in the field. You've seen what we've done to, uh, to uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Let's not have a repeat of that for both of our sakes. Mm, so right. I think when you appeal to that level of humanity, you know, any advanced civilization like the Japanese were, they, you know, were at least able to, you know, to, to put aside a lot of their, uh, you know, a lot of their base emotions and say, well, hey, gosh, you know, this is a really big deal. And uh, I would rather, I would rather endure five years of an American occupation and have a long lasting peace than to not only lose the emperor, but to lose all things Japanese. Because it was Admiral Halsey who said, and he was actually pretty proud that he said this. He said, you know, by the time this war is over, the Japanese language will only be spoken in hell. <laughs> and I don't think any of the Japanese people wanted that to become a reality. So, right. So that's well, you've got to think now, mm, as well as did. Our, mm. our countries do work together and do so much, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, there's, you know, Americans and Japanese families all, you know, integrated and happy and, you know, so it's still, I mean, it still wasn't that long ago. The sport over there now. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's really, it's, it's look at Japanese it's, people here and, and, you know, we go over there and, and when we even look at allies and, you know, climate change, which, you know, I'm sure everyone's going to yell at me for that, saying those two words too. Um, <laughs> but we are allies in a lot of things, you know, and I think that is an important thing that you bring up because even when we talk about these wars, I, you know, I, I want to make sure people know it's like, we're just talking about the wars that mm -hmm. that stuff went down and this is what people did. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's, um, it doesn't mean we say it's, it's right or wrong. Because well, the it's Japanese just, were badass at happened. war. They really were. And it's like, you know, you can't, 
I mean, they did yeah. some oh, bad okay. things, and and us Americans, have, I think, in war is war, right? But um, it's not against each other of today, right? And but right now, I can I can sit there and say bad things about what's going on in you know Putin land, or, or what Putin is doing to other. But they that might you know slowly calm down. Hopefully, you know it's um, war is complex. Oh, of course. You know, it's you people. know. I, I remember. Um, my grandmother talking about kamikaze pilots mm -hmm. and saying that our our forces were never expected they were expected to their life on the line absolutely in defense of our country but her description of a kamikaze pilot was they would they would fly into a building crash it and they knew they were going to die but they did it anyway mm. i don't think our armed forces were expected to operate on that kind of level right you know there was a we wanted our guys to come home and our women to come home we didn't want them to to die in that manner but the japanese it's, i'm only saying what my grandmother said whether she's right or wrong i you know I don't know, but she had the thing about the kamikazes and uh, that they were brought up to die in their planes or they would be dishonored. That, you know, whether or not that's true. Well, I really do think that there is a lot of truth to that. And we have seen that level of thinking, you know, in. Mm -hmm other cultures not just in the far east i, I was mean, gonna say right. september 11th you know right you know and i mean i also think i also think um back to the days of the peloponnesian wars you know and i i think of the battle of thermopylae and and, and i think of the culture of the spartans you know where they say hey come back with your shield or on it you know mm. yeah it, it's 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 and that's where martyrdom it's, comes from too you know and is that yeah. it's that sacrifice at the same time martyrdom it's weird it's a weird balance of words and truth you know yeah. so it, it um it, it's <laughs> it's gone through a lot of cultural revisions over the years but you still see that way of thinking pop up now and again you know i think where we have it as americans is that you know we know that if you enter into the armed forces at some point in time, you are going to write that blank check out to Uncle Sam that is payable mm -hmm. for an amount up to and including your life. Mm -hmm. But that's not the have all end all goal. I mean, the, the goal yeah. is for you to fight if you're called to, and if you do have to fight to come back and live to tell about it, if you right. want to tell about it, that is. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, yeah, it, you know it, it, there's, uh, I think a lot more, I think there's a lot more glory to surviving than absolutely there is to dying, you know? Mm, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and that's the other thing that goes into even now when we look at, you know, people say, you know, supporting our troops and, and putting, you know, money into the military, it is important that we have the best equipment that people come yeah. home, that they're not going out with, you know, rickety fighter planes, you know? Mm -hmm. Not saying that that I, I'm not getting into that. I can't talk on it, but I'm just saying that our our budget does need to include the right things, right, Mike? I mean, you served. You, they, mm -hmm. you want a tank that really goes. You know, you can't. It's just like Nancy having to deal with her computer, <laughs> has to get a new computer and be nice to it, and you need the new computer. And and so do you know our middle, our military as much as you know. We I don't think any of us want human beings to be at war, but no. That's Not this is just rational. a reality of life. That's who we are, and and you know it, it is all we all want peace, but um, you got to be prepared because nope. you could be all you know. You can't be you can't be asleep at the wheel. It's not allowed. It's not allowed. Mike's always fun chatting with you, even though we talk about some crazy topics. My gosh, you know, so happy new year, by the way. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is a quite a quite a uh, story to talk about. So, uh, you know, Coyote Recon is out this, you know, the story about uh, J.D. Vanderpool. So I'm really glad you captured his. What's next? 
Well, gosh, so let's see. Um, have three different projects in the hopper right now. So of one of them is another story on the Vietnam War. It is told mm -hmm. from the perspective of a of a um, combat engineer company, and oh. uh, yeah, and then there is also uh, there's also one that's coming up on the spy war in Bosnia, and wow. then let's Ooh. see after after that one, after that one uh, there is. Um, well, I th think I've mentioned this before. It what was the book on the MiG-29. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, cool. awesome. So everyone, yeah. MikeGuardia.com is the website. Mike is here every first Monday. So in February, our next show is all about presidents who served in the military or at war. So we each picked presidents and I'm still flip-flopping on it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I just, you know, well, because there, there's, they're interesting. So, you know, yeah. I, I know we're going to have some good conversations. So uh, everyone stay tuned for that. Keep up with us at bigblendradio.com. And of course, you can get Mike's books on Amazon. Thank you so much as always, Mike. All righty. Thank you, Bye. ladies. It was a pleasure to be on the show. Yeah, cool.